welcome back. In this video we're going to have a quick talk about the Euler phi function. Um, it's not going to be a long video, but it's a useful uh, function that counts the number of elements relatively prime to a certain number. Okay, so let's just dive straight in and give the definition. So here it is. Uh, the Euler phi function is defined as follows. Now it's defined for only positive integers. And it's defined to have phi of 1 being equal to 1 and phi of n being equal to the number of positive integers that are both less than n and also relatively prime to it. Okay, now we've actually come across that set of numbers a number of times. So that's just the order of the set u of n. Okay, so let's just um, enumerate some examples just to get used to this. Uh, so let's just make a little table. So we have n and phi of n along here. So we'll go, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, maybe it's about 12, so long as it fits, which it does. Okay, so 5 of 1 is by definition 1. 5 of 2 is also 1. There's only one number less than 2 that's relatively prime to it, which is 1. 3 has both 1 and 2. 4, well, that has 1 and 3, so there are 2 of those. 5 has 1, 2, 3, and 4, so there are 4 of these ones. 6 has uh, 1 and 5, so there are 2 there. 7 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So notice with prime numbers, it's a little bit easier than the others. 8, there are 4. U of 8 has 4 things. 9, there are 6. Uh, that's any, 1, 2, 4, 6, and 8, and 5. Okay, so there are 6 of those. And 10, sorry, 10 has 4. We've looked at u of 10 and u of 12 a couple of times. You know, they, they both have 4. And 11 has 10 things relatively prime to it. So you notice that for a prime number, equals p minus 1 for p prime. All right. Now, I'm not going to prove these in this video, but there are a couple of really interesting relationships that help us to determine phi for larger numbers. So there are a couple here, and they're not that hard to prove. In fact, I may ask you to do it as an assignment question. Um, one says that phi of p to the n, so p is a prime, is equal to p to the n minus p to the n minus 1. This is for p prime. Okay, so that gives us powers of, it doesn't look quite right, gives us powers of p. And the second one is if m and n are relatively prime, then phi of m n is equal to phi of m phi of n. Okay, so that actually gives us an easy way of calculating pretty much phi of any number without having to just think really hard and test every number to see whether or not it's relatively prime. Okay, so that is, let's have a look at an example of how these things would work. Let's say we want to do phi of 360. Well... Looking at our, our calculation tools here, we know how to do prime powers, and we know how to do relatively prime. So if we perform the prime factorization of our number, then that will let us use these rules to split, it, to split it up. So note that 360 is equal to 5 times 72, which is equal to 5 times 8, which is 2 cubed, times 9, which is 3 squared. So that means that phi of 360, notice that all of the prime, these three prime powers, this one, this one, and this one, they're all relatively prime to each other. So I can just do those separately. Phi of 5, phi of 2 cubed, phi of 3 squared. Okay, we know that phi of 5 is 4. We could also use this formula if we wanted. 5 minus, which would give us 5 minus 1 is 4. So that equals 4 times 5, 2 cubed. Now 2 is prime, and um, we're cubing it. So p to the n will give us 2 cubed minus 2 squared. And that will be all times 5, 3 squared. Now p is 3 and n is 2. So I'll have 
3 squared minus 3 to the power of 1. That equals 4 times 8 minus 4 is 4 times 9 minus 3 is 6 which is 6 sixteens, which gives us uh, let's see, 96. Okay, so you can go ahead and calculate 5 for any number so long as you can perform its prime factorization and then it's quite straightforward using these two rules. Okay, so it's worth, having, it's worth proving these ones in their own right, but I'm just going to skip that out um, in this video and leave it as an exercise for you guys. So this brings us to our next theorem. It's um, a theorem that says how many elements of order D there are in a cyclic group. So if D is a positive divisor of N, so I've got uh, N is the group size of a cyclic group, and D is a divisor of it, the number of elements of order D in a cyclic group of order N is 5D. So let's have a go at proving this. Okay, well we know from the fundamental theorem of cyclic subgroups that there is only one subgroup of order n. Okay, there is exactly, of order d, sorry, exactly one subgroup of order d. Okay, this is a fact that we know from the by the fundamental theorem of cyclic subgroups. We also know, know that elements of order d they generate cyclic subgroups of order D. So any element of order D must be a generator of this subgroup. Okay, so we're not going to find any elements of order D in any subgroups other than that one subgroup um, of order D. Okay, but we also know about generators of that subgroup. We know that um, if if the subgroup is A, so let the let the subgroup be denoted. Okay, so this is our single subgroup of order D, um, and it's a sub so a subgroup of a cyclic group. So it is it is itself cyclic. So we can just represent it by some generator. But we know that to find another generator of that, if and only if, uh, we should also include that the order of this cyclic subgroup is D. If and only if, remember, two elements are generators, if and only if they're relatively prime to the order of the group. Now the group in question is the subgroup that we're talking about here, this one. So the, from our theorem 3 point, whatever it was, uh, 4.2, sorry, um, the n from that theorem is going to be d here, the order of the, sub, the group in question. And so we know that the GCD here, k and d, equals 1. And there are 5 of these. Elements. And that proves the theorem. Okay, so if we built our subgroup and we just gave it a name, sub cyclic subgroup generated by A. So that is a subgroup of order D. And we know that another element in that cyclic subgroup, A to the K, is only a generator if k is relatively prime to the order of that subgroup, which is d. And by definition, there are only phi of d of these numbers. So that proves the theorem. Now this theorem has a corollary which allows us to generate the number of elements of order d, or generalize the idea, to any finite group, not just cyclic ones. So the corollary to this theorem is that in a finite group, okay, but this time we're not talking about a cyclic group necessarily, the number of elements of order D is a multiple of phi of D. Okay, so let's have a go at proving this one also. Well, let's just um, rule off some simple cases first. Often a good idea. So if there are no elements of order D, we're done. Um, because phi of d clearly divides 0.
otherwise. Okay, it's often good just to, to dispense with these sort of edge cases up front. Otherwise, we'll let A be a member of G such that... So we'll choose an element now of order D. Okay, so we know from our theorem that the cyclic subgroup generated by A has phi of D elements of order D. Okay, um, if this is all, all the elements of order D, then again we're done because phi of d divides phi of d. Otherwise, we'll assume, we'll choose a b in g such that the order of b equals d and b is not in our cyclic subgroup generated by A. Okay, so we've plucked out another element of order D, um, and we've specified that it's not in the cyclic subgroup that we already have. So we want to show that there can't be any elements of order D in common between these, okay? Because if there were, then we wouldn't have a multiple of 5D anymore. So hopefully there are 5D elements of order D in the in this cyclic subgroup generated by B also so that we now have two lots of them. Okay, so need to show that there is no element of order D in both A and B. Okay, so, again, to do this, we'll suppose there is one. Order of C equals D, and C is in A, and C is also in B. Okay, well, if C was an element of order D in both of these cyclic subgroups, then it follows directly that it would have to generate both of them. Thus, so if we assume this, the cyclic subgroup generated by C is equal to both of these, and therefore they are both equal. Okay, hence, because we've constructed it so that it can't be the case, there are phi of d additional elements of order d in the cyclic subgroup generated by b. Okay, so essentially we just comp we continue this construction until we've run out of elements of order d. So every time we make our little set we, we, are, we generate a cyclic subgroup from an element of order D. We then see if there are any elements of order D left that aren't in that set. We make a cyclic subgroup generated by that one, and we continue until we've run out. And what we'll get eventually is that overall, each one of those things we generated will have five of D elements of order D, and we'll be finished. Continuing this way, we have a multiple of 5D elements of order D as each cyclic subgroup constructed
provides phi of d additional ones. <laughs> 